Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. In this episode, we don't talk about dinosaurs, we're talking pterosaurs. And Dr. Adam Rutherford learns how he's been taken in by a false dinosaur trope. Hello and welcome to a new episode of Terrible Lizard Series 3. This week, we're not strictly going to be doing Terrible Lizards, are we, Dave? No, we're doing another reptile group who are, in the minds of most people, entirely synonymous with dinosaurs, but are not. They're not dinosaurs, but they're not birds, and they're not crocodiles. What are pterosaurs? First of all, we'll, we'll avoid trying to fill the entire episode with this because actually the, the origins of pterosaurs is what I did my PhD on and there's actually just been a fairly big paper come out on this just a few weeks ago on this subject. So it's going around again. Pterosaurs are the flying reptiles that lived alongside dinosaurs but were not dinosaurs. Uh, they went extinct with the dinosaurs and they appeared probably about the same time as part of this big radiation of reptiles in the middle to late Triassic period. So they're almost certainly very close relatives of dinosaurs. And in particular, this paper that just came out a month or two ago suggests that they are closest to a group called the Lagopatids. The Lagopatids, the drinking dinosaurs. Yes, the the drunk ones. Well, again, not dinosaurs. So immediately prior to the origin of the group that we would call dinosaurs, where on a big family evolutionary tree, we'd draw a line, say everything past this point is dinosaurs. There's a bunch of other little groups, little in the terms of we don't have too many animals and little in the sense that they weren't very big. You know, animals maybe a couple of meters long total, including the tail, a lot of them half that size. Small little bipedal reptiles, mostly little carnivores, running around doing little carnivory things. <laughs> uh, we oh, don't need to get into all the details of these groups, uh, but the Lagopatids are one of those groups, and it now looks pretty likely that they and the pterosaurs are very close relatives. So pterosaurs are probably what we officially would say are our sister, so they're the nearest relative to the Lagopatids, and together that group actually sits just outside of dinosaurs. So pterosaurs are very closely related to dinosaurs, and they show a huge number of features which we would associate with dinosaurs, but they are not them. Okay, and this is obviously, when we say pterosaurs, everybody knows what a pterodactyl is. That is what we're talking about. Yeah. But there are more than pterodactyls because there are some massive ones. And and pterodactyl is itself a, a problematic term. I know some academics who still use that term. I know some academics who absolutely despise that term. I'm closer to that side of things than the than the other. And that, that comes down to a kind of historical quirk, because actually the first pterosaur specimens discovered predate the dinosaurs by about 50 years. Oh, wow. And the first one was eventually named Pterodactylus and was before it had been given the formal scientific name of Pterodactylus was called Pterodactyle. And this was named by the famous French anatomist Baron Cuvier. And Cuvier called it the Pterodactyle and then later kind of formalized that to Pterodactylus. And so that's where the idea that pterosaurs should be called pterodactyls comes from. But it's not the correct name for them. And often people use the term pterodactyl to refer to pterodactylus and its near relatives. So part of the reason that I don't like using pterodactyl is some people in their heads would picture any random pterosaur and some people would picture a very specific pterosaur. And it's like, that's a really bad way of dealing with this thing. So the safest thing to do is just not use it. So yes, what, what people will have heard of as pterodactyls, for most people, we just mean pterosaur, and pterosaur is the better word to use it, in my opinion. And they're really diverse. So again, people have probably heard of pteranodon, they've probably heard of pterodactyl or pterodactylus, uh, they've probably heard of Quetzalcoatlus, which is one of the really big ones from North America. That's a massive one. That's scary. It's one of the massive ones. There's a, there's a bunch that size. And then they're probably kind of running out. But pterosaurs, there's at least 150 species named, probably actually closer to 200 these days. They lived for just as long as the dinosaurs did. So 150, 60 million years. Um, they were on every continent. Uh, they're much rarer than dinosaurs because their bones are so unbelievably thin and fragile. 
And so their fossil record is very poor, but they were almost certainly present in huge numbers. You know, we're, we're just not finding them because they didn't preserve rather than they were rare animals. Because when the preservation conditions are right, they are present in huge numbers. And so their, their, their diversity and, and other things were almost certainly much greater than we, well, m- certainly much greater than we, we recognise. But still, most people could name four or five at a real push. And there's a couple of hundred. And they span everything from about a metre in wingspan to 10 metres plus in wingspan at adult. That's ridiculous, 10 metres. That's massive. Yeah, so, I mean, the standard thing is, you know, fighter planes, a small private jet, not even like a little hobby pilot has, you know, one propeller, two seat. Not like a little tiger moth biplane. No, even, even that's six, seven metres. We're talking significantly bigger than that. It's ridiculous that these things... Okay, and so they got... The reason you had such big things in the air was because they had the hollow bones, like dinosaurs had hollow bones. So so there's a combination of factors that l- allowed even the very big pterosaurs to fly. I mean, the first thing we should say is that these were... All pterosaurs that we know of were true powered flyers. There's this idea that they could only glide... Um, you know, they had to jump off a cliff or jump off a tree or use wind um, to to get height. No, these were these were proper powered flyers. These are not flying squirrels or flying lizards like animals that basically have to go down. If they could stand on the ground, jump into the air, and and fly and flap basically. So partly, yes, they they're hollow bones and they're extraordinary hollow bones. I mean, these big pterosaurs we're talking about, yeah, these animals with ten meter wingspans. Some of the big bones in like the neck and the arm they're 98 plus percent air by volume wow like you know that um that thin cardboard that you get the slightly plasticky stuff that you get often on the lids of takeaway meals and stuff like that (laughs) no i don't i eat healthily dave i'm not like you (laughs) it's not paper but it's you know it's it's card but that thin cardboard or that you get in when you buy a shirt in in m&s and there's a sheet cardboard so much thicker than a piece of paper, but much thinner than what you'd normally consider a cardboard box. That's how thick the bone is. So literally these massive creatures, you could crush them. You just poke your finger through them almost. So what it's got inside is tons of tiny little spaghetti-like struts. Okay. So it's super, super thin-walled, but it has a whole bunch of support in it. Okay. We're talking about bones that might be a metre long. That's how thick they were. So if our bones are like Mars bars or Snickers bars or marathons, they're crunchies. I mean, there's so much more in a crunchy than there is in a pterosaur <laughs> bone. I mean, extraordinary levels of bone reduction. And that's part of it, but that, that only explains so much. Now, there'd also then be... So the air sacs, we've talked about air sacs in dinosaurs and birds and that would connect to the lungs and other bits of the body. They'd have that too. So it's not just that the bones are hollow. Big bits of the body would have these big air cavities in them. So in other words... These very big animals are a lot less heavy than they look. Um, But the other reason that in in particular the big ones can fly is that when they take off, they're taking off with their arms. Birds actually do a terrible job of flying in some ways, and one of them is the way they take off. So when pretty much any bird takes off, what it does is it either runs or jumps into the air with its legs and then starts flying. Or if they're a swan, goes for ages along the water. Right, and they're flapping the whole time. That's actually a terrible way of getting into the air because these are flying animals. They have massive flying muscles, and yet they're not using them to start the launch. Um, So what they actually then have to do is have relatively big, heavy legs to have the power to jump into the air. And then they're lugging around the dead weight of those heavy legs when they fly. This is a bad combination. What pterosaurs do, and actually what bats do, is they have tiny spindly little legs with almost no muscle in them, which are just there to help them walk around and be stable because they walk on all fours. But when they start to fly, when they launch... They're basically pushing off the ground and jumping with their wings, the things with the massive flight muscles on them, which is a very sensible way of launching into the air. It's, I mean, actually the best analogy I can give is the, as this awful Soviet era fighter called the Yak. And the Yak was supposed to be the competitor to the Harrier in that it was supposed to be a vertical takeoff jet. 
but because they never developed the way of getting the thrust vectored, they basically put an entire second engine in this that's only job was to lift it up and down. And then, of course, when it's trying to fly normally, it's got the weight of an entire extra engine on it, which meant that it kind of sucked doing both. That's what birds are. Whereas pterosaurs and bats are a harrier. They've got one engine and they use it to take off and then they use it to fly. Now, what confuses me, and we're getting a bit off subject already, but I want to, I just, you mentioned... We're on to Soviet-era fighters from the, from the 70s. I think we're already somewhat off topic. I'm happy with that. I'm happy with the axe. We're good with that. Do they have um, pink milk? Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Would there be, in the late Cretaceous, just before the KT expansion, a time when you could look up in the sky and you could see a bat, you could see a pterosaur, and you could see a bird? maybe wow so right so there's this big there's this big idea that b- birds basically outcompeted pterosaurs and th- that's really poorly supported birds and pterosaurs were around for about 100 million years together so if birds were outcompeting pterosaurs they did a very bad job of it and, it, <laughs> and they certainly hadn't succeeded by the by the kt extinction um so there were loads of birds and pterosaurs around together birds may well have outcompeted some of the smaller pterosaurs um, but even then, um, pterosaurs like dinosaurs would have been independent very young. We have excellent reason to think that baby pterosaurs were flying soon after they hatched. Yeah. So you've then got the position of like, OK, I can see how a crow sized bird was not in competition with, say, a five or six meter wingspan pterosaur. But the babies of those pterosaurs would have been bird-sized and so would have been occupying potentially at least the same space and trying to eat the same prey in the same way. And so birds clearly weren't out-competing them. Otherwise, the adults would never have survived because they never have got to adult. Um, so birds and pterosaurs, yeah, overlap enormously. Bats, we don't know. So the earliest bats, I want to say bats, are obviously not my thing. The earliest bats, I want to say, are about 70 million, uh, sorry, about 62 million years old, something like that. About three million years out. So within a few million years of the end of the dinosaurs. And they're, they're, really, they're really very batty. <laughs> By what I mean is that they're not some kind of proto-bat with sort of wings, but long fingers, but not... No, it's, it's a bat. It's clearly got a few more little things, um, but it, you know, it's 90% of the way there. And so the long-standing question, my understanding would be, again, not a mammologist, don't do bat fossils. You've got, you've got an either or. Either bats evolved really fast after the mass extinction to get like fully bat within a couple of million years, or they were knocking around in the Cretaceous and we just haven't found them, and then they survived the mass extinction. Um, and it's one of those ones where neither of those looks too plausible so which is it <laughs> both are wrong yeah maybe a bat was transported back in time as a fossil it's it's a really nice annoying thing where either way the answer is absolutely fascinating this is either stunningly quick evolution or incredible survival and a bad fossil record and it's like ugh. um so i i mean my money would be on the rapid evolution you've just had a mass extinction you've wiped out loads of flying things there's lots of eco space to explore for small mammaly things that might be a good time to start evolving flight so to speak um but i i think it is a non-zero possibility that there could have been Cretaceous skies with all three vertebrate-powered flyers in the same time and space. That's pretty cool. So let's go back to pterodactyl. No, not pterodactyls, because that makes you angry. Pterosaurs. Pterosaurs. <laughs> not going to make him angry, everybody. It's going to be fine. <laughs> so um, pterosaurs, th- th- talk to me about, what's it called? Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl. So Quetzalcoatl is like the kind of archetypal giant pterosaur. So this is the one which we're pretty confident has a wingspan of 10 metres wow. plus. Weighed somewhere between 250 and 350 kilos, which on the one hand is extraordinarily heavy for a flying animal. But compared to a plane other, of equal size, there's nothing. But on the other hand, yeah, it's extremely lightweight indeed. So uh, the, the standard drawing, which is entirely kosher, is a Quetzalcoatl standing next to a giraffe. And they have big heads and great big long necks and little bodies with great big long legs. They're, they're actually vaguely giraffe proportioned. And a giraffe that size weighs... Eight nine hundred kilos, a heavy male, ton and a half. So yeah, to to be 
somewhere between a, a third and a fifth of that weight whilst being roughly the same size and in some dimensions being much bigger because they've got a much much bigger head yeah their heads are weird aren't they yeah I mean a cat's alcohol you the head is about two and a half meters long the neck is about two and a half meters long and then the body the actual like chest cavity is about the same well not much bigger than mine wow <laughs> And he doesn't have a two and a half meter long chest, ladies and gents. Yeah, and I've, I'm. Yeah, I've, all right. It's actually a fair bit bigger than that. But what I mean is, like, not absurdly bigger than a big human. Wow. C- certainly not like an elephant, which you might expect for an animal that's these kinds of dimensions. Um, and then an awful lot of weight. Talk to me about the head. It didn't have a beak, but when you... Oh, did it have a beak? I mean, I, I sort of see them... Because um, I'm remembering, you know, I'm looking at bits of paleo art that I see and also, you know, I don't know very much about them. But they look a bit like herons. Yeah, so in in that regard, the he- the heads are really quite heron-like. It It is a... Or a stork, if you don't know what a heron is. Yeah, it, yeah, it, 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 yeah it is a big, long, pointy head, basically. That, Attack you with that's my face. That's really Attack what it is. Attack you with yeah. my face. Um, and Quetzalcoatlus and and indeed the the rest of its group these are called the Ajdarkids. Um they're, they're found all over the place. So I've named one from from Canada. There's stuff from North America. What did you name it? Do you remember what you call uh, it? Cryodracon, well, the, the nice. frozen dragon. That's pretty cool. Um, but there's a bunch from Russia, from Mongolia. There's uh, quite a bit from France actually, uh, and down in Romania. Um, so they're, they're certainly all over the Northern Hemisphere. I'm sure they're down South and we just haven't found them yet. Um, but yeah, they've all got these great big, long, spike-like heads. And the, the interpretation of their biology is very stork-like, or at least some, some of the more terrestrial storks. And hornbills, or some of the big ground hornbills, are a, a kind of good analogy. They're basically wandering around in these relatively open environments. They're probably taking stuff near water when they can, but they're, they're fundamentally terrestrial. And they're just grabbing and swallowing lizards and baby dinosaurs and probably mammals and snakes and birds, whatever else they can. Yeah. And they probably scavenged a bit if they could and found a big dead dinosaur. There was an idea for a long time that they were dedicated to vulture like scavengers, which we're very confident that they weren't. There was an idea that they were truly heron like and standing in water and fishing. They probably got did that, legs. but that's not their. They've got great big long legs, oh, do they? Uh, these ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is what I say, giraffe-like proportions, really long legs and really long, really long forelimbs as well. more like bat legs at the back. But I know they had the big long arms, which they used yeah, to fly. Uh, the, 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 the Ajdarkids specifically have very long legs as well, okay. which is one of the reasons they're, they're very terrestrial. So they could still, as I say, jump and fly very happily, but we think they're probably walking around a lot. That's fundamentally what they're doing. So ground hornbills for people who know them, you get the the kind of red faced ones in southern Africa. They they turn up on um, if if you've ever been on safari down there, you've probably seen them. But they they turn up on documentaries periodically. That's what they do. They they walk around in this long grass and they're basically going after little lizards and mice and and eggs and stuff like that. that but of course, it's been really long. I'm sorry, but that's well, the, 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 the yeah the. Um, and then, you know, but if trouble comes along or the place they're in really isn't very good or they need to get to some water, they just take off. Take off. But they're not flying, 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 flying. So that, that's what we think the, the Ashtar kids at least were, were probably doing. The flip side of that is something like Pteranodon. Big Pteranodons are looking at seven plus meter wingspan. So these are... Again, Big. not small pterosaur. You know, you go, oh, well, the difference between seven and ten meters is is colossal. And it is. But seven meters is also still massive. absolutely massive. Um, and Pteranodon is a proper, you know, albatross-like pterosaur. It's way out to sea. It probably doesn't see land for days, weeks, months at a time, potentially. And, you know, hyper flyer really good in the air and living out the ocean and, and, and taking fish. Okay, you're going to have to explain to me how you can tell that one isn't a scavenger and the other spends days out at sea just from a skeleton or a fossil, sorry. Ajdarkids don't actually show kind of scavenger-like heads. Um, that, that that beak is really good for striking at stuff. It's really not very good for ripping chunks of dead dinosaur off. 
Um, so that's the first one. The second thing is they're really good at walking, which is not what you want to be as a vulture-like scavenger. You want super efficient flying transport. Why do you need these great big log lengths to walk everywhere? That's a very bad way of getting around and finding food. Um, in the case of Pteranodon, um, some of the proportions um, that, in particular, actually, Pteranodon has fairly short legs, that changes the wing shape. Uh, we should talk about that in a, yeah. in a minute as well. Um but m- the main reason that we think Pteranodon lives miles out to sea a lot is, so m- almost all the Pteranodon material comes out of Kansas. Um, there used to be a giant inland sea in what is now the continental US. So imagine basically almost sea-shaped ring of modern America and all of the middle was an, was an ocean. Um, and we know roughly where the then coastline was. And basically all the Pteranodon stuff comes anything between one and two or three hundred miles from that coastline. Wow. They could just be the failed Pteranodons who got lost. And that's where they died. <laughs> we find them in huge numbers. So they were out there in very large numbers um, and a hundred miles from the coastlines. So they're flying. We also found a bunch of Pteranodons with fish in them. And um, the flip side of that is I, I helped uh, describe a Pteranodon neck with a shark tooth wedged in it. Ooh. So these Ooh. are reasons to think that they're going out to sea quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite that's quite exciting okay let's talk about their wings though because all that big wing i think we might have said before somewhere or at least you've told me this so it might not have been recorded but that is their little finger it's it's the it's their ring finger so te- pterosaurs basically have four digits so when you look at a pterosaur hand, it has three fingers that we call them the free fingers because they can move and wiggle about. And then the giant finger that they're flying off actually bends in the opposite direction, so 180 degrees out. So if you curl your three fingers flat onto your palm, you want your other finger to go literally fold back the opposite direction. Ow! Yes. Don't do this at home, kids. It's a really quite neat piece of evolution where they basically entirely rotated that joint 180 degrees so it folds in the opposite direction to the rest of the fingers so they couldn't make a fist or if they did it only with the first three yeah and the other one will sort of fold back on itself the wrong way yeah and the, and so that's the spar it's the it's the leading edge and then from that there is a giant membrane which attaches from the tip of that wing all the way down to the ankles and we we're very confident of that and i i wrote with some colleagues a paper that established this is there a little hook or something that shows a bit of on their ankles is there a bit of membrane attachment bone no there isn't but we've got enough fossils where the membrane preserves where you can see it going down there so this this is a weird thing about pterosaurs so i said their their fossil record in on the one hand is terrible because their bones are so thin they don't preserve very well on the other hand when the preservation is exceptional and this is actually similar indeed the same places we get a lot of the feathered dinosaurs well, the pterosaurs are preserved just as well, and things like their wing membranes are nice and thin, and they also preserve. So, yeah, we have a bunch of complete articulated pterosaurs with wing membranes. We've got them with the with a like pelican like throat pouch. We've got them with little webbed toes. Um, we have uh, the other thing we've got is they have what are called picno fibers. Um, which are not feathers depend- and not fur. This is another huge question, which is part of the reason that pterosaur origins are very interesting. Is oh, so they they are f- simple thin filaments, just like the simple thin filaments we get on early feathered dinosaurs, and like some of these simple thin filaments that we get on some of the Ornithischian dinosaurs, which again may or may not be feathered. And so this is this huge question of. Did that single filament originate before dinosaurs and then was inherited by pterosaurs and the ornithischians and the theropods and then lost in various individual groups? Or has that evolved twice or has that evolved even three times? We don't know. So for n- some people call pterosaur filaments feathers. I think that's not a good thing. It might be correct, but we don't know it's correct. 
So I think for now it's easier and better to call them picno fibers. And if they ever turn out to be truly identical to feathers, absolutely we need to change that and call them feathers. But until we know that, I think it's safer to call them something else. Okay. Because that's that's avoiding making an extra assumption. So I'm I'm almost imagining them to be sort of slightly velvety then if you went and stroked one. Would that be right? We've only got a handful of specimens that show this. Most of them don't show it particularly well, but I don't think there's anything reason to think that most of them probably had it and they would have had it across most of their head, body, arm, leg. At least a couple of them appear to have some of this on the wings as well. More sparse, but present. So maybe elephant-like in the, you know, or like a pig, you know, a few odd hairs in in, in places. Like a human. Yeah, or or your average not particularly hairy human. Um, oh, I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, bit, bits of me are a good analogy, others, others less so. <laughs> But yeah, most pterosaurs were probably furry. Um, it turns up in a whole bunch of very differently related groups that are a long way apart evolutionarily, environment, time, and therefore, the, you know, there's no obvious reason to think, oh, well, it's just in them because they lived in the Arctic, or it's just in them because they came at the end and they'd only just evolved it. They're all over the place. So it's probably true for all of them. And do we know anything about colours? Because I see paleoartists do some quite spectacular colours. We've talked about the melanosome stuff for, for birds and dinosaurs. There's a couple of pterosaurs have been done for melanosomes. Melanosomes, they were very boring brown colours. But they were very boring brown colours on a group of pterosaurs called the Anurignathids, which are considered to be basically bat analogues or nocturnal. night jar analogues. So probably nocturnal or at least very low light, small, hiding, living in dark forests. You'd expect them to be browny, greeny, dull colours. Um, yeah, you often see spectacular coloration on a lot of the big pterosaurs. Um, I think that's probably pretty likely because, again, some of my sexual selection stuff, there's very good reason to think that... So loads of... T the other reason pterosaurs are often famous is the big head crests. Mm. Pteranodon being a famous one with its big kind of wing off the back of the head. It's basically got its head going behind it. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, but Pteranodon has nothing on quite a few others in terms of elaborate head crest morphology. <laughs> like, Pteranodon used to be like the poster boy of that, and it is now kind of way, way down the list of mad headgear in pterosaurs. Like, it's not even making the top 20. But yeah, these are almost certainly sexually selected and display features in flying animals that don't particularly have to, like, camouflage or hide themselves. It's hard to hide when you're a big... <laughs> when you're 10 metres long. <laughs> well, right, but, but... I'm a cloud! <laughs> but there are these, there are these trade-offs, you know. If, you're, if you want to hide from predators then being big and bright might not be a very good idea. If you can't hide from terror predators anyway because of your whole lifestyle, then you've got nothing to lose by being bright and everything to gain if you're brighter than the other guy and you get more female. So, yeah, th there's... There's lots of good reasons to think that the, the, a lot of the pterosaurs were extremely bright and, and colourful. Talk to me more about these weird shaped heads. I want to know what shapes they were. So, so if you it, the the absolute kind of almost pinnacle of insanity is a thing called Nyctosaurus, um, which Nyctosaurus is probably a pretty close relative of Pteranodon and actually lived in same time and place. Um, it's very rare we have only a handful of good specimens, uh, unfortunately. It's rather smaller, so two metre wingspan or so. It's it's, big. Uh, That's about with mine. It, it, it is, but for, for pterosaurs, particularly pterosaurs of that time, it's positively tiny. Mm. So, so, so Nyctosaurus has two weird things going for it. First of all, it got rid of its three first fingers. It basically just has a little bit of a nub. Oh. And the interpretation of this is that Nyctosaurus is even more amazing long distance over water flying adapted than pteranodon it's on land so rarely that it basically doesn't even need fingers when it's walking around um that that's our interpretation i think that's very solid the second thing is which we've only known about for we can say about 15 years now is that nyctosaurus has a has a big head crest like a upside down seven yes that's a good description as big as one of its entire wings, 
bolted onto the back of its head. So now I'm thinking it's more like one of those Star Wars ones. What are they called? The the, the, the little Imperial yeah. uh, shuttles that you get with the three... Right, except that the, the head one doesn't have any membrane on it. We're pretty sure it's just bone. Right. So there's no there's no flag there it's waving with a skull and crossbone. No, so. it's it's more... It, you will see it reconstructed like that. Almost all the toys reconstruct it like that. A, because I think they think it looks cooler and B, because I think otherwise it's almost impossible to make the model. Choke hazards. <laughs> Choke yeah. hazards. Well, you can't give children stuff that's effectively a spike. That's, yes. Uh... But yeah, that, that, that's a head crest bigger than one of its wings on its head. That's pretty insane. Yeah. So, so, so when you say Tyrann- you know, Tyrannodon's got a, a flat spar about three quarters of the size of its head off the back, it's, it really doesn't compete. <laughs> So I think we hit the one thing we should really talk about because I mentioned diversity early on is kind of like the three big groups of pterosaurs, if you like. Um, so the, the kind of distinctive morphological groups. So the first one to talk about is what are called the ramphorinchoids. The ramphorinchoids. I, coids, yes. And I, 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 I'm trying to do air quotes, which of course doesn't show up on the podcast. Um, so a, the proper term for ramphorinchoids is non-pterodactyloid pterosaurs. What? Um, but as that's a bit of a mouthful, we'll, we'll stick to ramphorinchoids for now. Um, <laughs> so the ramphorinchoids are mostly not very big. So the biggest ones are about two meters or so in wingspan. Same as that's obviously still that's still yeah that's still pretty hefty, but compared to our you know the later ten meter giants, that's not very big. And many of them were rather smaller. Um, there's a myth that you get really tiny pterosaurs, and you you actually don't. It's because a lot of species have been named off these flying juveniles, and so there's a lot of oh there's these twenty centimeter wingspan pterosaurs. No, those are juveniles. The smallest definitive adults that we have are about a meter in wingspan. That's pretty so, small seagulls sort of size. Yeah, yeah. So by, by our bird standards, you know, that's a pretty big flying animal. And it's not that there weren't much smaller pterosaurs flying around, but as species, the adults are, are not much below a metre. There's, there's some which are in the kind of 70, 80 range, but the idea that there are 10, 20 centimetre wingspan pterosaur species is, is not true. So they range from about a metre to two metres, and the Ramphorinchoids have a relatively small head. It's about the same size as their body. And a relatively short neck. It's about the same size as their body. Um, and so does that they mean they're one third body, one third neck, one third head? Roughly, though those proportions change between various things. It still seems like a really small body. Yeah, it, it, it largely is. That's probably a bit of an exaggeration. The body's a bit bigger and the neck's a bit smaller, but they're mm. roughly that thing. They also have a relatively short wrist and they have a really long fifth toe on, on the foot, which supports an extra little membrane between the legs. And with one exception, they have a really long tail. Oh. And that's basically your your ramphorinchoid bow. So a bit more, bit more dragon-like with a, a web web between their legs and a long tail as well. Yes. And did the tail um, was that part of the webbing? So did the webbing attach to the tail, or did it just attach probably, to the legs? Probably, yes. That that that's a big. De- We've only got two or three of them which actually have that leg membrane preserved. Um, it doesn't show up very well at all. Um, but there's one particular specimen which, ironically, the tail is not attached to it, mm-hmm. but you can see that the membrane meets at this very sharp point, and that would be very hard to do if it didn't originally meet What's the tail. tail. Yeah, yeah. Because it would be under tension, so it can't be sharp. Um, it would have to be rounded, and it isn't. So I, I think that the tail has moved mm. afterwards, but I think originally it must have done. Um, but that, that's your ramphorinchoids. And then the second group we're going to look at, we're going to jump the middle, and we'll get to why we jump the middle. Okay. The second group is the pterodactyloids, so named from pterodactylus. Um, okay. And there are, there are some small pterodactyloids. The smaller ones are about a metre in size oh, again. Okay. Indeed, pterodactylus is about that big. But they go all the way up to Quetzalcoatlus and its relatives and... 10 meter plus wingspan but they have huge heads much bigger than the body they all have huge necks much bigger than the body so you've now got a long head and a long neck a short metacarpal so that is what the the bones that make up the palm of our hand um and the pterodactyloids it's the longest bone in the wing so rather than the shortest bone in the wing it's now the longest so that's an enormous elongation 
their fifth toes, rather than being a great big long thing, are now the shortest toe. Okay. There's still a leg membrane, but it's going to be much, much smaller. And the tail is mostly tiny. Okay, so they don't have a so, nice whippy tail, they just have a little stubby thing. Like no, they just, they just have a little stubby one. So you've got big head, big neck, giant metacarpal, small fifth toe, small tail. And then in the Ramphorhynchoids, you've got normal head, normal neck, short metacarpal, long fifth toe, long tail. So that's a pretty massive difference in some major bits of the biology. They didn't have a, an extra bit of webbing between their legs either. Or so, they? so both have it, but it, it's bigger in the ramphorhynchoids because they've got a tail, presumably to attach it to as well. Yeah, and well, and that bigger fifth toe because it's attaching to the fifth toe. Oh, as yeah, well. of course, yes, right. Ah. And then, so the reason I've done kind of left and right and lift out the middle. So for a, for forever and a day, um, I mean, we're talking about until a, ten years ago or so. So pterosaurs have been known since about 1780. So between 1780 and 2010, this is what we had. These two distinct groups and nothing in between. Nice and simple. And then somebody went digging. Right. And, and the, the ramphorhynchoids come first. There's a brief bit of overlap. And then the pterodactyloids are there and the ramphorhynchoids are gone. So it looked like one group evolved, was around forever. A new group appeared, got rid of the old ones, and they went off and went mad. So what happened? What, what, what was the change that went from Ramphorhynchoid to Pterodactyloid? And how did that happen? And then Darwinopterus turned up. And since Darwinopterus, we've now got like a dozen of these things because now we know exactly what we're looking for. Suddenly we're finding loads of others. It's, it's so often the case with these kind of things. It's almost a cut and shut job because it's got a great big Pterodactyloid head and a great big Pterodactyloid neck but it's got a short metacarpal and it's got a long fifth toe and it's got a long tail. And it's like someone took a head and neck and bolt of a pterodactyloid and bolted it onto the body of a ramphorhynchoid. So from that, we know that the head and the neck was the first thing to, to, to evolve. change, yeah. And, and that probably drove some of the other changes later. Yeah. Um, what's also interesting is the metacarpal is short, it's, it's definitely a more ramphorhynchoid-like one, but it's longer than any of the other ramphorhynchoids. Okay. And the tail is long, but it's shorter than any of the other ramphorhynchoids. So it's... It really is a middle ground. Even the metacarpal and the tail are starting to go. So you can see them just edging over and you can see where it's going and yeah we we so we now have this third group which have actually become known as the wukong opterids which is a name i hate because uh, <laughs> there was another thing called wukong opterus which we in hindsight recognized as part of this intermediate group because this is what we discovered is we had a bunch of these heads which went oh it's just a pterodactyloid and then once you know what darwin opterus is you go actually there's a couple of subtleties in this that don't turn up in the pterodactyloids proper Oh, and it's in that one. Oh, and it's in that one. Oh, and it's in all these isolated. There's, there's a British one. Oh yes. And yeah, it was just it was just a head, and so it was named as a pterodactyloid. And then once you know, because it's got all the proportions and shapes and features of it, and then once you know, you go actually, it's about the right age, and it's got this, and it doesn't have that, and yeah, actually, it's it's another one. They've already spread, and we've now got a bunch of them in the Middle Jurassic of China, and then the Late Jurassic of Germany and the UK. And so we now have this third kind of distinct little radiation that sits in the middle, which is clearly a kind of halfway house b between the two, which is really quite neat. Explain to me the big advantage of if they are losing their tails and getting bigger and getting bigger heads. What do you think? I mean, what what are the what does that tell us about their environment and how they're adapting and changing? Is it just so they can go fishing? Dunno. Dunno. <laughs> One problem you've got is there's about 20 or so pterosaur researchers worldwide. This is a, it's a tiny field mm. and I would include myself in that list. And pterosaurs are only half of what I do because I spend the other time doing dinosaurs. Dinosaurs is not an enormous field. You know, there's 100, 150 people worldwide and I'm not including PhD students. I'm talking about like kind of permanent academically tenured researchers. You know, 150 is not a lot of people, but You're it's special. a hell of a lot more than 20, some of whom are part, <laughs> many of whom are part timers. So there's very few people working on pterosaurs, um, which obviously really hinders this kind of research. And then again, we've got these huge gaps in our knowledge because their fossils are so few and far between. 
and absolutely all over the place. And they don't have anything like the cachet or, or research money and attention paid to them that dinosaurs do, in addition to not having many researchers. So stuff like this is incredibly difficult. I, I can't think off the top of my head of any seriously proposed hypothesis as to why, what pushed them to suddenly get these big heads there's an idea that once you'd got the big heads in these Wukongopterids, the rest of the body kind of followed because it facilitated certain other changes or, or even forced them. So one thing about having a big head on a big neck is it actually shifts your center of mass forwards mm. and that changes how your wing has to operate. That's probably got something to do with how the metacarpal is changing. That may then influence the wing shape and the aerodynamics, which might then change the tail and the, and the toes. Um, but how you get the big head is then becomes the big question. Because clearly you can have a big head on, on a Branfarinkoid body. Otherwise, we wouldn't find so many of these damn things all over the place. And it wasn't just some instant transition. I think that's what people thought is despite the rarity of pterosaurs, the assumption was, well, this must have just evolved really quickly. Mm. You know, it, it happened in a flash. It, it's your bat equivalent of something triggered the big head, the rest of the body evolved with it. This happened in a couple of million years in, in one space, and then they spread. And if we don't have the right fossils from the right time and place, we're, we're just never going to see this. And clearly that's not the case because we've got them in the UK and Germany, and we've got them in China, and across at least 10, 15 million years. This wasn't some instantaneous event. So then the question really does become, well, what drove it? And what's so great about a big head compared to the others? And there's nothing obvious <laughs> that I, I'm aware of. Sexual selection has to be that. Girls like big brains or something. They would well, have had it, big it, brains, presumably. No, but you, you, you can have a bigger crest on a bigger head. It, it's possible that that's what start to drive, drive it. Just, just get this massive head that completely disbalances their entire body. But, well, right, but then you you look at things, you know, like the horns and frills of Triceratops, you know, look at Megaloceros, the, the, the so-called Irish elk, you know, that's, was it like 30 kilos of bone or something on its head? <laughs> you know, the, the, sexual selection, oh. you know, look at peacocks, a huge amount of their weight is feather. And it's all about display, because if that's what gets you kids, then it's going to propagate and spread and become reinforced. It is not impossible that that's what drove this evolution. Other questions I have, very um, things. Now, they're quite bird-like in some ways. How is their, um, do we think they sang? Do we think that they had a good eyesight? What do you think? So eyesight, you, you can get a decent estimate of because of eyeball size. And some of them have huge eyes, so they probably had very good vision. But flying animals generally have good vision. The, there's the myth that bats have terrible eyesight. Actually, bats have decent eyesight on top of echolocating. Um, you want to be able to so see where yeah, you're that, flapping. Yeah, basically. Mm. Um, and, and see what you're hunting. I mean, lots of, lots of bats hunt by, by sight. Mm. Um, and fruit bats, of course, in particular, because they're looking for fruit and, and flowers. Fruit doesn't echolocate very well. doesn't make much noise <laughs> it's very quiet bananas just get me <laughs> sorry <laughs> sorry uh, there's, there's a there's a whole separate podcast of noise my fruit what noise does my fruit make <laughs> yes exactly there you go what what, yes, what yes. sounds tastiest yeah there's a, was it was it men behaving badly where they used to do cheese impressions possibly <laughs> never understand. um anyway could they sing like birds? Probably not. We we have one partially preserved trachea, um, so we've actually got a windpipe, and it's it looks like a boring, simple one. It's like what we expect other dinosaurs and crocodiles and things like that to have. It doesn't have any of the bird specialisations. Because you'd think over long distances they'd want to communicate if they're flying at sea and stuff. You'd think they'd want to like a call or something that they can... Well, that, right, but that doesn't mean they can't. It's just they're not doing complex songs and trills and huge ranges of... You know, if they all they need is a gull like... Argh! Yeah, then... We're going to have to roar at the end of this episode like a... Go, go, we have to go rock rather than roar. Yeah, exactly. In, yeah, in some ways, they were quite bird-like. In others, yeah, very different. They were quadrupeds on the ground. They walked around on all fours. Did they have web feet? At least some do, because we found them with the webbing. Cool. So they might quack. That's... <laughs> <laughs> if it walks like a duck and, exactly. and quacks like a duck and has a 10-metre wingspan, <laughs> it's, it's a pterosaur. Um, 
kind of related to that though we've already touched on this a little but you know there's a huge diversity of them there's this idea that like pterosaurs ate fish now there's a good reason for that because most of the pterosaurs that we find come from these marine deposits and therefore yes a lot of them were fish eaters because if your knowledge of world birds came from what you could pull out of the estuary you'd find ducks and coots and gulls and things like this and you would very rarely find robins and crows and vultures and things like that um and so yeah the majority of pterosaurs that we know of were very aquatic animals and were eating fish or fish related stuff squid they might have been grabbing starfish and sea cucumbers and bits like this um, but that's a real bias towards the fossil record rather than the pterosaurs. And again, in particular, those that lived inland are the ones that we don't tend to find. And actually, we'd expect the majority of the diversity there. Um, but even so, you've got Ketalcoathalus and the Ashdarkids, giant animals with big heads that appear to be active terrestrial predators. You've got a group called the Sungaripterids, mostly from China and Mongolia. They're interpreted as clam crackers. They've got these giant teeth. Then the teeth are actually covered in bone in the jaw. So there's like a tooth completely buried in bone. Weird. Which are really rounded and, and meet each other and it's ideal for smashing snails and stuff like that. And we find them in these big inland lakes with these giant clam beds. And it's like, well, there's a giant inland lake full of clams. There, it's a lake in a desert, so there's nothing else to eat. They're probably eating the clams. We've got the aneurignatids, which we mentioned, which are these little nightjar and bat-like flying insect hunters, probably nocturnal. We've got pteranodon, miles out to sea and, and fishing. Um, we've got um, a whole bunch of early things that were doing probably fishers in various different forms, but various different sizes and shapes, some of them with really weird teeth. Ramphorhynchus, for which the ramphorhynchoids are, are named, very famous as a fish eater, but I described a specimen, it's from Germany, but it's, it's held in a Canadian museum that has a coprolite, so it's got fossil poo, <gasps> which has something like squid hooklets in it. Oh, We're not yeah. sure, but we think they're squid. And also had a couple of random bones in the chest cavity, which as far as we could tell are not fish. So it looks awful, looks like it ate... Calamari and early mammal. Well, that's the thing. We, we, we just don't know what those bones belong to. They, it could be another pterosaur. It could be a crocodile. It could be a mammal. It could be a frog. Who knows? But the idea that they're these pure fish eaters looks pretty questionable. And a bunch of other stuff with weird heads and weird jaws. There's loads of filter feeders. There's loads of, well, in particular, there's a thing called Pterodostro from Argentina. Pterodostro is very like Pterodactylus. So a little thing, meterish in wingspan. Actually a very long tail for a, for a pterodactyloid. And this lovely scooped jaw. So this, this beautiful U-shaped, or, or very shallow U-shaped jaw. A thousand teeth in it. <laughs> A thousand. It's hard to count them, strangely enough, but there's about a thousand there. Why? 500 down each side. Why? It's a filter feeder. Okay. So every reconstruction you see, they, they paint them pink like flamingos, which is not impossible because they're doing a similar thing. They're, they're living in soda lakes. So where you find them, there's absolutely nothing else around because it's this horribly alkaline lake that basically nothing else can live in except the little shrimp eating the bacteria. And you've got very large numbers of this pterosaur that you never find anywhere else with a massive filter feeding jaw. It's basically a flamingo. <laughs> Wow. Well, now you, we've introduced us to the subject of rare creatures with massive heads. We have, as our guest this week, the magnificent, very brainy and very special. It is Dr. Adam Rutherford. What's your background with dinosaurs? What are you into dinosaurs? He's just got a Spinosaurus model out. I mean, that's a fairly <laughs> good start. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't feel I'm particularly unique in saying this, but I think the best answer to that would be obsessively and with a dead dedication that was reserved a dedication that was possibly only equaled by my love of star wars so oh, wow so we I, I, I'm, there, I'm, I'm i'm from suffolk so I'm, I'm i lived in ipswich when i was a kid and we i would force my dad to take us to the natural history museum which i consider to be my sort of spiritual home um I, you know we would go every few weeks but the other thing is that we used to go to there's a couple of beaches on the suffolk coast mm. uh, where you can do some good but well particularly sharks tooth hunting 
and yeah. and I've got uh, somewhere in a box in my parents' house. I've got literally, well, I in my head I want to say hundreds. It's probably more like twelve <laughs> shark's <laughs> teeth. That, That's a lot. Yeah, That's still better than nothing. Yeah. Well, there, 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 there are. So we could we could diverge immediately because I know of two different Star Wars dinosaurs trivia type things. What? Yeah. What? So um, right near the start of New Hope, where C-3PO and R2-D2 are going through the desert, and there's a big skeleton on the sand dune. Which is a crate dragon. Which is a crate dragon, which I believe has now turned up in the new Mandalorian series, but I haven't seen it yet. That is basically just a Diplodocus vertebral column with a head stuck on the end. And more, and more than that, it's the Diplodocus from One of Our Dinosaurs is Missing, the classic <laughs> Disney adventure. Because obviously, lots of Star Wars were produced in the UK, and I presume they just had it knocking around at Pinewood. But that, it's very obviously a Diplodocus skeleton. Well, I did not know that. I mean, I thought, I considered myself to be pretty high ranking in Star Wars trivia, and I didn't know that. So this is automatically a learning experience for me. Excellent. That's why we're here. Um, um, <laughs> Go on, give, give us your second fact. There's a, there's, a, there's a second one which is absurdly nerdy. Um, so there's some really good friends of mine who run the wonderfully specific uh, sauropod vertebra picture of the week blog. Um, <laughs> I know it well. Yeah, ob- obvious. I mean, it's, it, this is as nerdy as it gets as they're dealing with single <laughs> sauropod vertebrae. Um, but they they had something up about... So a padasaurus, uh, often conflated with brontosaurus, though we now know those two are genuinely distinct again. Um, they have these really weird, very cool neck vertebrae. And I think they did a piece on it. And then a few months later, I think it was, I think it was one of them, Matt Weddle. Uh, the, two guy, the two main guys who write it, Matt Weddle and Mike Taylor, are also both hyper Star Wars nerds. And I believe it turns up in one of the Clone Wars animated series. They spotted this fighter in the background of one of the shots and went, that looks just like <laughs> an Apatosaurus vertebra. Like, just like one. <laughs> and Matt managed to track down the designer of this. And it turns out that, lo and behold, he'd seen their blog and went, that kind of looks like a little spaceship. Oh, amazing. <laughs> and actively converted it. So there's literally a dinosaur vertebrae flying around as, I believe, a rebel fighter in one of the episodes. That is absolutely brilliant. Because we know that there's there's various thing, uh, sort of Easter eggs and weird things that have been yeah. thrown in over the years. There's a potato uh, in, in a, an asteroid, in an asteroid in empire. scene. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I didn't... Uh, that is amazing. I, I mean, that, both of those stories are amazing. I'm slightly more amazed that I didn't know either of them, though. <laughs> You do now, though. I yeah, think. Well, yeah gonna... all dinner parties will be made worse by your <laughs> bringing out the vertebrae fact. I'll, 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 I'll dig the links out for you. Maybe. The, the, se- the second one, it may have been a different, it may have been a different sci-fi thing, but I'm pretty sure it was Clone Wars. Yeah. But the first one is absolutely, it's the one of our dinosaurs is missing. Diplodocus is the crate dragon with just a head bolted on the end. That's amazing. And do you know it's a, do you know it's a Diplodocus because you can actually see the two dangly bones. Is that what that, the dangly so, bones is? How I describe, you know, I'm a very good anatomist. So, so that, that th- those are in the tail, and I'm not sure they show up because, of course, they've got it like sitting along the crest of a sand dune, so the bottom of the tail is buried. Um, but yeah, if if you know what the Diplodocus, or even just a sauropod vertebra in general, it's like really obvious a big series of sauropod vertebrae had very specific it, and it's the same so it's diplodocus it's diplodocus the famous dippy that we have you know touring the uk now and used to be in the natural yeah. history museum it's it's that it's one of the casts or a copy of one of those casts amazing i'm i'm truly tr- I'm, I'm now very grateful for having been invited on this i've learned something <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's one of those funny things about like being an evolutionary biologist, that you spend quite a lot of time, especially in the, when if you do science communication to, you know, the publics, you spend quite a lot of time saying, no, 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 what that wasn't like natural selection, you know, yeah. or in genetics, I spend quite a lot of time telling people that genetics is much less important than they <laughs> than they than they actually <laughs> think, which is a weird thing when you've basically been doing it for twenty five years. Sex determination is something that is really important in genetics, and you know we do it with x chromosomes and y chromosomes and but there's loads of methods and um reptiles and 
uh, extant reptiles do it via temperature determination and there's all sorts of mechanisms and i i just i'd love to know how dinosaurs did it and i'd, I'd love to know if it's even known um so it's not known and we don't know uh, and it's it's one of those classic problems that we've got from we talked about this before the, the phylogenetic bracket so modern birds are literally living dinosaurs um and the closest non-bird relative to dinosaurs still alive are crocodiles or crocodiles Dillions. And yeah, crocodiles are temperature sex determinant and birds are chromosome sex determinant. They have, I think it's X and Z, but it doesn't matter. It's just a uh, different W, w and Z. W and Z, thank you. And it's um, reversed as well. So it's not, so humans are, it's the males who are oof, heterochromatic. Yes. So we have X, Y, and, and the females have. We're homo. Exactly, two X's. Yes. <laughs> um, in birds, it's the other way around. We're better. I mean, I, I always think that the two X's, you know, we're complete. Women are complete. And you guys... <laughs> we've we've got bits missing. Half, yeah, you've got yeah. a bit missing. You've got this, you know, well, you've basically only just got another chromosome. And we get to accrue all the genetic flaws as well. Yes. So. I mean, there's there's two ways of looking at that. I mean, because one of your X's is always turned off in every single cell. But the other way is that the bit that we've got, the Y chromosome, is the crappiest, stunted piece of, <laughs> all, you know, slowly rotting out of existence. I think it's only got, I think it's, I think the human Y chromosome has got something like 37 genes on it. I mean, it's oh. basically a V. Wow. It's not even a Y, is it? <laughs> Here was a thing that yes. I was thinking about. We've got a lot of nests, right? We've got a lot of eggs from things like Protoceratops yes. and in the Gobi and place, other places. Yep. Could, could, is there anything you can glean from fossilised nests uh, or fossilised eggs that, that helps us work out whether they did have a sort of like, you know, like crocodiles do now where they... Where, where it is temperature dependent where you know an egg on the edge of a nest is more more likely to be female yeah. or male um I, I yeah i don't think so um i mean i oh so now i'm now i'm wondering if you could do something with some of the overact so we've got some of the the feathered dinosaurs that are relatively close to birds we have nests preserved where all the eggs are in a ring with a space in the middle um and in at least two cases we've got the adults sat in the middle um looking after the eggs now there's been lots of arguments about whether or not they are brooding them or simply protecting them um there's a guy called charlie deeming who i can't remember where he works now but he's a he's an egg biologist and he's done some nice work on that and he made a pretty convincing case a few years ago now that even though we've got an adult sat in the middle of the eggs and these are animals with big long wing feathers and lots of feathers on the chest that could really sit on them like a chicken but because of the nature of the eggs uh, of the egg shell that wouldn't work very well and they were probably better off being buried so he was effectively suggesting a model of they laid their eggs in a ring they buried them and then mum or dad sat on top to protect them rather than like a chicken they're actually sat and the, the eggs are physically contacting the parent if that's the case um, if it wasn't the case let's say let's say if the animal was directly sitting on the eggs then the parent would have quite a lot of control over that temperature and you would therefore expect all the eggs to be all the same temperature and I would say that that would argue for chromosome determination because otherwise unless you have some weird behavioural adaptations to make sure you shift certain eggs to certain places you'll always end up with all male or all female but if we don't think that's the case and charlie's right then it doesn't really tell you very much <laughs> <laughs> so i met a while ago must be a couple two or three years ago i was, I was interviewing steve brissati and and we talked about i rem- i'm gonna misremember this um, but that's never stopped me before. Uh, well, I know Stephen has worked quite well, so I may or may not be able to correct you. <laughs> S- start, we'll see how it goes. I've got this memory of him talking about how vegetation at the bottom of nests was actually uh, decomposing and, and creating heat. And that was an adaptation that lots of birds do now. And that they, he, I think he was speculating that we might see that in some dinosaur nests. So there is a heat generation um, from underneath. There's there's not many birds that do it now. The obvious one is the uh, Mallee fowl. So these are these big chicken-like things from um, uh, Australia. And Mallee fowl are really cool. I've actually been writing about them recently. Um, so they, they, they dig a big hole in the ground. They fill it with rotting vegetation and lay eggs in it. And then they bury them. 
Um, and I think I'm right in saying it's actually the male specifically who hangs around and will scrape off some vegetation to co- to cool it down and pile up some soil to heat it up as dependent. Um, though interesting, when the babies hatch, they're hyper precocial, which me so precocious as in they're 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 very well, I am independent. <laughs> yeah, oh, yes, 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 Izzy. Um, but they're, they're hy- these things can fly within hours of hatching. They're almost unique among birds in being capable of doing this. Um, so they're very, very weird in doing that. Um, but I think that's, that, I mean, there's a bigger group of birds, but I, th- I think that the mallee fowl and their relatives are the only group that regularly do this. Um, but yeah, we that that's the kind of stuff that we're talking about uh, doing for dinosaurs. Um, interestingly, we're very sure that pterosaurs did that because pterosaurs have a ridiculously thin eggshell and basically they dehydrate incredibly quickly if they weren't kept really quite moist and about the only way you could do that while still incubating them is to bury them in wet vegetation on cliffs is i mean that is isn't that where they were nesting that that's a lovely trope from the kind of 1890s through to about the 1950s um and the well this this is a classic complicated one so so ultimately that that trope goes back to two things first of which is the fact that we're talking about things like pteranodon so a, a big marine you know these are flying out over the sea we, we we find them literally hundreds of miles from the then paleo coastline um so these are properly ocean going animals um, so people interpret them as being very seabird-like, but also lots of people didn't think they could fly very well. And so this assumption was they had to launch from cliffs to get flying. And so the obvious connection was, well, therefore, they're nesting on cliffs. But actually, we have no evidence of that whatsoever, because, of course, cliffs don't cliffs are not the kind of places where you get really heavy sand deposition to make nice fossils. Yes. Um, so... <laughs> Who knows? Um, but but that's where that trope kind of comes from. Oh, that's. Um, I, I'm not. It's, it's perfectly possible that they did, and then they foraged inland yeah. to get some vegetation. But we, we have not the seaweed. faintest clue. Uh, it is moist, um, but when it, <laughs> I, I don't think it de. I don't think it decays very well. Not like oh. some nice pile of leaves would. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love the fact that I've fallen victim to a 19th century trap and and it's so easily debunked in the 20th and now 21st century but i've stuck onto it because so much of that just comes comes from you know kids dinosaur books where yeah. i can picture a you know pteranodon sitting on a cliff yeah. with a fish I mean, in its, its mouth well, launching off off the cliff and i haven't really updated myself <laughs> what was the what was the the, cre- the cranial crest on a the horn on the back of a pterodon's head was that sexual selection yeah um so i've published quite a bit on that so yeah it's been argued to be all kinds of different things some of it we actually tested um uh, a guy called ross elgin who did his he did his phd with me but he did his master's project with me um and we we made model pteranodon heads and flew them in wind tunnels we ross um, uh, <laughs> um, to test a bunch of the aerodynamic characteristics. And a- actually, it doesn't do very much to them, but it's certainly not any kind of beneficial counterbalance to the jaw, which has been suggested, or some kind of anterior rudder. Um, and, and this is, it, I mean, that was one which is always really, really, really easy to debunk because if it had any kind of mechanical influence on the skull, then you would, or the, or the flight characteristics at all, you would expect all pterosaurs to have evolved exactly the same structure. Yeah. And they're all different. Right. And and yeah. so in those sorts of traits, in secondary sexual traits, you, you, see, you often see sexual dimorphism. So the, the, the females have much smaller ones. And we do see that in pteranodon. Um, we, we see positive allometry, so the crest grows big late in life, which is another reason to think it's not aerodynamic, because then surely the juveniles would need it as well. Um, and this is a classic thing for, you know, tusks in elephants and horns in cows and things like this. You know, they, they grow they grow only when the animal's basically sexually mature. We do see that pattern in pteranodon. In fact, there's two different species of pteranodon, which you primarily tell apart by their different crest shapes. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's another reason to think it's probably not very mechanical 
So, yeah, we do see sexual dimorphism uh, and we see good evidence of sexual selection and we see no evidence of any kind of mechanical benefit. So there's... Those pterosaurs, Dave, they're not dinosaurs. Yeah, I know they are. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I, dis- I distracted you on that. Is this the nerdiest <laughs> issue you've ever done of this? I mean, we've gone straight in with some pretty technical stuff. Oh, oh no, I'm afraid yeah. not. We, we did an entire bonus episode on plants and that got really... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fossil, fossil plants <laughs> i bet yeah Paleo- yeah, yeah. Well, you, you might like this podcast if you ever want to have a listen to it it's quite um yeah <laughs> we did fossil pollen identification and what that means for climate so oh nice so a big thank you to adam rutherford that was just a small section of his interview we might have to <laughs> go back and revisit him because we did do a really cool long interview with him well i know a lot about pterosaurs now hooray i still don't like them as much as dinosaurs though because they're terrified um, I know. The, the, which would you rather be eaten by, T. Rex or a big um, terad- pterosaurus? I, 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 I don't think a Quetzalcoatlus could eat a human. They're, they're, reckon- their heads are very, very long. They're not that wide. Um, they, they're going to be thirty-ish centimeters wide at the back. So certainly, someone like me you're not going to get me down. Um, they might beat me really up and stab me a lot. Thin. They could, yeah. they could suck you up like I, spaghetti. I, yeah, I, I, I think you're pretty... I, I think they're eating really small stuff. Okay. They've not got the big hook-like beak. They don't have like a, a, a flesh hook like you see in vultures and falcons and things like this. So they can't tear stuff off. So they can't grab something big and take bits off it. They're going to have to be an owl and swallow whatever they have and their their yeah jaw size say a 10 meter wingspan animal's got a throat 25 30 centimeters across it's gonna be small i mean whatever poor creature is being eaten by them it's got a long journey yeah it's gonna take a while yeah long journey down to their stomach that's that's quite a that's quite a trek oh well that's good so but i I still wouldn't want to sort of like come up to one in the long grass because it could still stab you with its face oh oh yeah i I think it's it's a bad move to tangle with one but i'd i'd fancy my chances more against that than (laughs) the tyrannosaur i'm pretty sure though you couldn't fly on the back of them because you'd be too heavy you just paleontologists and scientists are also nerds People have looked at the mechanics of it, and it might be possible. Oh, great! Oh, that's good. That's good. So, um, I, I don't think either of us could, because we are too big. Mm. Um, but somebody small, somebody light. It wouldn't be a surprise if they could lift maybe 50, 60 kilos. So if you're a fairly small, light person, and then obviously you've got your saddle and rig, but you in theory could fly on a on one of the big ash darkids. I mean it depends how soft yeah. how slippery their um uh, filament feathery type the, things are which the are fibers they're, they're, they're mostly not that long so you're not going to get a great big handful of them. I think you'd need a little you'd need a little harness of some description. Maybe you could just generate enough um static electricity on the back <laughs> just to cling on to it through yeah, I'll, static. I'll, I'll I'll rub a balloon on it before <laughs> I get on. It will work very well. Trouble is then when you hit the ground the whole thing would just go bang. Anyway, so with that image uh, we will see you uh, uh, next week. Thank you once again to Adam Rutherford. I should say that. And yes. I've been Izzy Lawrence. This has been Dave Hone. Rack. <laughs> I was supposed to say goodbye that, and that, then that's the rack. Well, you could have said goodbye, or, or, or at least that's not that's not a proper. I, I wanted a <laughs> type. You know, <laughs> that's what you need. Surely it's not a rack like a dinosaur, is it? It's a <laughs> that's really quite good. Thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast with Izzy Lawrence and Dr. Dave Hone. This episode was only made possible thanks to our patrons on Patreon and for listeners like you who share our content with your friends. So please spread the word on social media. You can find us on Patreon, Facebook and at ISZI underscore L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E and at D-A-V-E underscore H-O-N-E on Twitter. Include the hashtag Terrible Lizards. Ask us your questions via terriblelizards.co.uk. Email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. We are hoping to bring you so much more, but we can only do that if our audience continues to grow. So please like, share and subscribe.